Hi, welcome to It's Not Your Money, real talk about achieving racial equity in philanthropy. These slightly irreverent but frank conversations feature leaders challenging the status quo, plaguing philanthropy today, and those that are demonstrating how we can collectively build a more equitable and just funding landscape, particularly for Black, Indigenous, and other people of color, women, and non-binary funders. Founders, founders. I am Jasmine Shams Lau, Senior Advisor of the Capital Collaborative by Camelback Ventures and your host today. I spent a dec decade leading a California family foundation, advocating for philanthropy with humility and co-authored the book Unicorns Unite, how nonprofits and foundations build epic partnerships. And today I'm thrilled to welcome Alandra Bulger, Executive Director of Coact Detroit. Alandra, welcome. Yes, I'm in. Good. How's it going? <laughs> it is great. Um, first of all, can you tell our audience a bit more about yourself? Sure, absolutely. So um, first of all, supreme gratitude for the opportunity to be in conversation with you. Um, it's so hard to believe it's been three years since we hosted you as a keynote speaker at the Coac Detroit launch. Um, and so much has changed since then. And so it's it's really great to be here with you today. Um, as you mentioned, I have the, the, the distinct honor and privilege of serving as the inaugural executive director at Coac Detroit, um, where we really center our work around accelerating uh, transformative impact with the nonprofit and community um, organizations in, in Southeast Michigan. Um, our team and our community partners are, are really working to build a future um, where systemic barriers that undermine community power um, and success are, are overcome through working together um, and really advocating for equitable access to resources. Um, and so I've spent my entire 20 year career in the nonprofit sector advocating for these types of things. Um, I consider myself to be a catalyst, a connector, um, and what I call a strategic agitator. And I'm really energized by possibility um, and challenging what's possible. Um, outside of my role at COAC, I am a music lover. And so I'm currently in the process of revisiting Mary J. Blige's entire music catalog. Um, I'm also a hip hop artist and what I consider to be like an amateur budding outdoor enthusiast. So I'm getting really into like kayaking and hiking and, and all that good stuff. So really trying to uh, embrace the, the, the multiple uh, seasons we have here in Michigan. Amazing. You are quite a Renaissance woman. I am <laughs> loving your introduction. Uh, and, and what was that phrase that you used? Uh, is it catalytic agitator? Strategic agitator. Strategic agitator. Uh, yeah, that might be my new favorite phrase. <laughs> Still it, use it, spread it. Uh, I feel like it's, it embodies a lot of what many of us uh, are doing in our work. Brilliant. Thank you very much. I will be very happily borrowing that phrase <laughs> at some point in the future. Um, okay, thank you for that intro. And before we dive into your work, I just want us to quickly have a chat about language because yeah. as uh, anyone who's watched this before knows, the, one of the reasons that this series is called It's Not Your Money is because when we incorrectly label the money in foundations and donor advice funds as still belonging to the founders, then we act like that money still belongs to them, like the foundation yeah. belongs to them. And that really perpetuates the concentration of power. <coughs> so our words influence who holds power. So Alandra, what shift in language do you think we need to make to diversify power? Yeah, thanks, Jessamine. That's such a, a great question. Um, so language is immensely powerful, right? And we know that intimately at COAC, um, from our name to how we approach the work, um, we think about words as ways to create new possibilities. And so the word COAC literally means to work together. And so starting with our name and, and kind of moving on to what we do and how we talk about it can, can often be a catalyst and a conversation starter about transforming the status quo and really kind of moving the needle. Um, we found through our work that funders are actually interested in authentic connection and, and really want to make an impact. Um, and in parallel, grantees want to have the resources to do the work that creates impact, right? And so we tend to want the same things but our language um, with each other and about each other um, often creates barriers and creates distance. And it can really feel like we're speaking in code. And so language can certainly influence who holds power. So for example, um, at COAC, we don't use the word empower. 
you know, um, from my perspective, how can you empower someone who already holds power? It's more about illuminating, um, respecting, and, and really supporting the power that people already have, right? Um, a similar example to that is the idea of who uh, has expertise, right? And who we consider an expert. And how are we, you know, it's, it's important to interrogate the question of how are we measuring and valuing um, the unique to live experiences, skills, and expertise that people bring to the table. Um, I think that power shifts when we when we share values, but that also translates into how we value each other. So, for example, um, when we say that we want to see more equitable funding in our region, that means that we recognize that many nonprofits, particularly those led by Black people uh, and people of color, they don't get the same funding for the same and often more impactful work. We have data that backs that up and we have stories of the lived experience that backs this up. Um, and we won't get to a more equitable funding landscape on the data alone. We need to tell the stories, show what it looks like, um, show how it, what it looks like to do it well. And so language is an important component in that process. Oh, there, there was a, a ton in there. Alondra, thank you. And I, I love, again, this shift of the language around, um, you know, we're not empowering people. We're not necessarily giving our power or someone else's power to them. We're illuminating the power that's already there. Perhaps it's latent, perhaps it's, you know, undiscovered. Um, but the, the illumination process is just highlighting what is present in all of us. Absolutely. Um, that is, is beautiful. It's a very uh, powerful image there. Um, so you and I met, you mentioned this a few years ago, back when you were first opening Coac Detroit. Um, and you mentioned how the, the just the name of Coac, the act of co-collaborative action mm -hmm. uh, is, is a, an attempt to capture this demonstration of equity of real partnership. Uh, and I'd just love to hear kind of how COACT has demonstrated that in terms of philanthropic practices, because you started with one core funder. Um, and how did that COACT spirit show up um, in real life in the formation of this community? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so as I mentioned, you know, we've we publicly opened our doors um, back in June of 2019, um, but that was after several years of kind of best practice modeling um, and stakeholder engagement. And so COAC really emerged from the desire um, to have a hub for nonprofit support and collaboration in Southeast Michigan. Um, we were uh, open with an initial investment from the Rob C. Wilson Jr. Foundation. Um, and, you know, when I came on board as an executive director, as I mentioned, a lot of the research and stakeholder engagement had already taken place. Um, but I also recognized that we needed to go a bit deeper uh, and, and, and really um, uh, expand the reach of the nonprofit community um, perspective and what they thought priority should be around COACT and how to get them more involved. And so during our stakeholder engagement, um, we heard a lot of things, a lot of needs, a lot of possibilities, um, but I'll, I'll share a few. Um, one, we heard a strong desire for COAC to be somewhere where people could come together, um, really build authentic relationships, um, and be able to express their vulnerability as leaders and as organizations without penalty, right? Um, we also heard a strong desire to disrupt the status quo uh, and to no longer accept business as usual. Um, and so we started really deep trying to gain an understanding of what nonprofits needed um, and how we might develop something that met the moment. To, to be clear, our community has tens of thousands of nonprofits doing amazing work every single day. And we wanted to make sure that we, you know, weren't and aren't duplicating those efforts. Um, and so a big part of our work is to amplify and connect the existing resources in our eco ecosystem um, while identifying the gaps where we can really add value and be impactful. Um, in that stakeholder engagement, we also heard that the power dynamics within the philanthropic community here um, are often extractive of nonprofits, right? And that in a lot of respects, it, it doesn't feel inclusive. Um, and so when we were building COACT, we wanted to build something that felt welcoming, um, that felt transforming, healing even, right? Um, and kind of like a breath of fresh air for the sector. Um, and so three years later, I think we can, can say with certainty that we've been able to be creative disruptors and catalysts. And that's largely due to our partnerships 
um, our platform and our approach um, to learning. And so when we talk about equitable funding, we think about it through a few different path, mm -hmm. a few different pathways. And so one is through our own grant making and programming, um, which is collaborative in nature. And our methodology really seeks to include shared power and responsibility um, with our community in shaping the design, the implementation, and even the selection of the grants. Um, we bring together advisory groups and selection panels, and they help in making those final funding decisions. Um, one example I'll share, um, a few years ago, we launched the Activate Fund. Um, it was a $1.5 million fund with racial equity at the center. And it was the design to pilot and model new ways of making grants and supporting the nonprofit ecosystem. Mm -hmm. And so we started by focusing on meeting nonprofit needs and pairing that with skilled and specialized supports. And we also looked to really cultivate collaborations in that process. Um, when it was all said and done, 68% of those grantees were led by uh, BIPOC uh, leaders and 62% were led by women. In the process of the Activate Fund, we also launched an earned revenue accelerator. And the emphasis on that was really to support self-determination through revenue generation and products. And the majority of the participating organizations uh, in the accelerator were also led by people of color. Um, and so we've since replicated this approach with more direct resident input as a new partner in the KIPP D Plus program with the Kresge Foundation and Michigan Community Resources. Um, we are also in the process of launching a new participatory funding program um, for BIPOC-led youth serving organizations. Secondly, um, another pathway that we kind of like to, to use is convening cross-sector um, folks to have candid and actionable conversations. Um, and most recently, this has included a nonprofit funder dialogue series. Um, so over the course of three conversations, um, we brought together foundation leaders and BIPOC nonprofit leaders creating a neutral space for honest conversations and the exploration of ways to increase funding to BIPOC led organizations. And so since our inception, we've been shaped by community needs and priorities. Um, and we are constantly learning, modeling, expanding the table and gathering the data and then telling the story. Wow. <laughs> Alanja, I don't know if you know like how unusual and <laughs> it just just incredible all of this is, you know, like for anybody who's coming from traditional philanthropy, you know, who's maybe heard the words participatory grant making or, you know, sharing power or collaborative decision making. The, they're they're almost like they they can feel like oh that's the nice to have that we want to get to in like five years ten years ten <laughs> years time, and just to hear the line upon line upon line of activities and experiments and demonstrations that you and your team have created with the community, um it's it's not just inspiring but it's like really hopeful for me to hear to and and I I think for others to see this is already happening like people are doing this it's yes. not rocket science right this is this is not something that needs a 20 year strategic plan yeah right yeah. um and and I think one thing that I would just love to dive into a tiny bit more is you you mentioned that the space that uh your stakeholders wanted to create, particularly the nonprofits, was one where they could be vulnerable. I think that is, is so important for us to just pick up on for a second because in the in the relationship between funders and nonprofits, right, vulnerability is not something that is typically involved in yeah. any of our interactions. You know, there's there are real consequences. Yes. for expressing actual vulnerability of ourselves or our organizations or our leaderships or, or our leadership, or our teams, um, if, if you're a nonprofit talking to a funder. Um, and so that combined with what you've mentioned about, you know, healing as well. Um, and and, and the, this, this, you know, processes that reinforce self-determination as well. Um, I I would love to hear how the funders have reacted to your different way of doing things, of providing a space where nonprofits feel 
safe to be vulnerable, of of coming to a conversation uh, in a place of self-determination. How have funders reacted to that? They've responded um, surprisingly and overwhelmingly um, positive to it. Um, you know, I, I lifted up the nonprofit funder dialogue series. Um, we put the call out for foundation leaders in our region to participate and they showed up. Uh, and not only did they show up, but they engaged. And those were some really challenging conversations because uh, there was honesty, right? And there was honesty, not just about, um, you know, so much funding does it make it to BIPOC led organizations, but about the harm mm -hmm. and the trauma um, that BIPOC leaders um, have experienced uh, yeah. in, in relationship to philanthropy here. And so um, you, you mentioned, you know, all of the kind of dots on the screen that we have lit up that we're working on. I really see our work um, as planting seeds for that type of long-term change and transformative change that we know takes takes time. But a lot of what we like to try to do is demonstrate what can be possible when we're willing to have the difficult conversations, um, when we're willing to um, renters really center um, our humanity with each other, right? Mm -hmm. and, and test the assumptions that we have about each other. Can, can you just, can we just dig in just a tiny bit more into these dialogues that you facilitated? Because I think this is really, really rare. Like I've really only heard of this happening a couple of times before uh, in other situations where funders and nonprofits are having true, honest, vulnerable, like they're getting to the real, real stuff yeah. that causes the friction, the distrust, the like the miscommunication, the filtering in our relationships. Um, and I guess like, what did you do to make that space safe for the nonprofits to speak their truth and yep. for the funders to hear without defense? Yeah, that's a great question. So first and foremost, we um, approach everything that we do in partnership and with the lens of co-creation. And so this particular set of dialogues we, we hosted in partnership with the Johnson Center for Philanthropy at Grand Valley State University. And so we had that thought partnership at the table with us as well. Um, but we also recruited the participants in the dialogues to help shape and inform what those sessions looked like, what questions they wanted to dig into. Uh, and that was the funders as well as the nonprofit leaders. Um, and so, you know, we also weren't prescriptive about what those three conversations looked like. We allowed it to evolve in the way that it needed to. Um, and in the context of those conversations, we created an environment where funders were able to have candid conversations in a group of funders together. And the nonprofit <laughs> leaders were also able to do that uh, and then come together and really um, embody a willingness to listen, right, and, and hear deep and listen deeply and to really hear where people were coming from. And so I think that uh, notion of co-creation uh, and that willingness for folks to to show up and really have an authentic conversation because there there is a, a sense of shared values and there is a sense of um, a shared goal, right? Mm -hmm. And so I don't think anyone came to the table just to say that they were sitting there. People came there to be able to help facilitate change. And I think we recognized everyone there that in order for us to start to move in that direction, there has to be a level of truth telling. There has to be a level of honesty and vulnerability because what we've done in the past doesn't work. I wish I could have been there. <laughs> it really sounds like an amazing experience that you were able to have together. Um, and is that something that was a one-off or is that something that you do regularly and it's kind of a muscle that you're yeah. all exercising? Yeah, it's a muscle we're exercising and it was a pilot opportunity for us to bring those folks together. And so where we are in the process now is we are uh, kind of assessing the recommendations that came out of those dialogue series and, and thinking about what, what the path looks like moving forward. And again, always developing that in, in co-creation with the folks who participated. Brilliant. Thank you. Yeah, I think the, I think the I think what we walked away with was wanting to make sure that whatever comes next 
is actionable and impactful. And so we want to be really thoughtful about that. Mm -hmm. oh, I really appreciate you sharing a bit more about that, Alondra. Thank you. Absolutely. Um, so another thing, another topic that I would love for us to talk about for a little bit is uh, <coughs> because COAC set out to reimagine capacity building um, and capacity building in and of itself, very, very, very common activity for funders to undertake. Um, that really doesn't mean that it's done well, though. Uh, <laughs> and so my question for you is if you could, you know, make, wave your magic wand and change, you know, one or two things about the way funders provide capacity building support and particularly for black and brown led organizations, like what, what would you change? What's your advice? Yeah, so interestingly enough, when we were um, developing COAG Detroit and bringing it online, four of our intermediary partners were actually um, interrogating the very question that you just asked, which is how can we uh, reimagine and redefine capacity building in a way that's more impactful, particularly with a, a, a lens on racial equity and racial justice. Um, and so those partners developed uh, a report and a, a, a approach called Building a Network. Um, and so before I go into building a network, I want to just um, kind of think about the context in which we're working and why this is important, right? So um, here in, in Southeast Michigan and in the Detroit area, um, we recognize that while the, the number of nonprofit organizations continue to increase, right, like there are new organizations popping up every day, um, our, our, our outcomes in our community remain poor, right? Um, we recognize that nonprofit organizations led by people of color remain under-resourced and lack the access they need to, to meet their missions. Um, we recognize that institutional racism um, is embedded in the attitudes, the practices, and the culture of the nonprofit ecosystem. And, and as we discussed, um, you know, we recognize that boards and executive leadership um, of most nonprofits are disproportionately white. And that leads to a skewed perspective when it comes to problem solving needs and priorities. And so those four intermediary partners um, really took a look at capacity building and thought about it through a more holistic um, approach. And that first, um, first tier is kind of really looking at what nonprofits need and addressing those capacity needs while, while also not generalizing, right? Like meeting nonprofits where they are and understanding their individual unique needs and providing the supports to address that. Um, the other piece to that is really focused on building a network of cross-sector actors that are working together, connecting resources, leveraging relationships um, to really move the needle in our community. We recognize that the challenges we face are more complex uh, and much too big for any one organization or even any one sector to, to be able to address alone. Yeah. And then to get back to um, <clears throat> how we think about this, particularly for BIPOC or Black-led organizations, that idea of capacity building centers racial equity and racial justice. And so we're, we're thinking about those leaders and those organizations front and center in that approach. Um, so when I think about what, you know, what we need uh, in order to, to address capacity building in this way. Um, the first thing that I would say is we need patient capital. Um, this work takes time. Uh, and oftentimes that work is not in alignment with the timeline set for a grant, right? Um, especially if we're allowing ourselves to be led by what's happening right? Um, mm -hmm. If it's not prescriptive, like life is happening on, a, on an everyday basis. And so that should really be informing how, how our work is moving forward. Um, nonprofits are like the ultimate capacity builders for funders, right? And so um, nonprofit success is funder success. Um, and so nonprofits are, are often very lean, resourceful, and adaptive, but that takes a toll. And you can't be effective running on low all the time, right? Like real capacity building support would recognize that people um, are at the heart of organizations and they need time, they need investment and they need rest and support. Um, and that they are not just like impact machines churning out work, right? Um, the other thing that I would, would amplify is that we need trust. Um, we hear the term trust-based philanthropy a lot these days. Um, and we know many funders like to use the term, but but what does it mean? What does trust really mean, right? 
Um, it, it means trusting each other to use resources responsibly, right? In service of the mission. It doesn't mean conditionally granting dollars or micromanaging every move. Um, it goes back to what we talked about in terms of like what it means to value expertise and, and how we think about that. And so um, philanthropy is built on relationships and an organization's capacity thrives when those relationships are built on trust. Amen. Yes, 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 yes. Um, I, I really um, thank, thank you for ending on that, that note of trust because, uh, yeah, I, I completely agree with you. I think that that is one of the biggest missing pieces in the relationships that we have inadvertently designed between funders and fund seekers. Um, and if we can center that humanity and you know, really figure out, okay, what does it mean when two humans are coming together to try and work on this? Absolutely. It's a very complex problem. Um, but with the resources and the roles and the representation that they have, like how do we just start with a conversation of trust? Right. How does that lead to an interaction of trust? How does that lead us to a relationship of trust and then you know that leads to us being a community that is uh that that has trust at its center as well absolutely um, yeah no i really ap appreciate your points alandra absolutely um i uh, unfortunately uh have to kind of start to wind us up we are coming to the end of our time together today but let's end reflecting on the future Alondra, if your dreams were realized for complete magical transformational <sighs> reform in funding and philanthropy, <laughs> if funders did all the things you dreamed of, uh, how would things look different for bike pot communities, communities of color like Southeast Michigan, let's say 20 or 25 years from now? What does wow. that look like? Um, so like I I certainly recognize that the work that we're driving doesn't happen overnight, right? Mm -hmm. um, however, I do see the, the efforts of today as, as really kind of planting seeds for the long-term um, vision and, and kind of dreams that you talk about. Um, and so for me, like those seeds include building awareness about and the acceptance of more equitable funding practices. Um, and we try to help that through like concrete examples and, and programming that really shifts thinking and how things can work in our ecosystem. Um, I mentioned that we're focused on a few things um, as we as we think about the future. And so transforming our ecosystem to be one that is more connected, more resilient, and more equ equitably focused is front and center. And when I think about the next 25 years, I want to see the social conditions for our community transformed. You know, um, I'd like to see and live in a place where, where everyone has access to a great quality of life outcome. Um, I like to to see and live in a place where we transcend this this notion of like scarcity thinking and really embrace abundance. Mm -hmm. um, I like to live in a place where the color of your skin doesn't determine your altitude or define your perceived worthiness, right? Um, and so at a sector level, to me, this looks like funders and their boards um, really embodying the ethos of what you're talking about around it's not your money. Um, and that's in terms of payout percentages, uh, in terms of representation, uh, in terms of embracing risk taking and an appetite for failure um, and seeing that failure as an opportunity for a deep learning. Um, and then certainly in terms of sharing um, power and decision making, right? Um, to me, this looks like a stronger, it looks like stronger, more connected communities um, that have more say in the decisions impacting their lives and their future. Um, I like to see a decrease in the race leadership gap and an increased number of nonprofit executive leaders and board members who are people of color. Mm -hmm. I think our community will benefit tremendously from more diverse perspectives um, and, and perspectives that understand the needs and priorities of our community and are able to problem solve through that lens. Mm -hmm. um, I'd also like to see more investment in the overall well-being of nonprofit leaders who pour so much of themselves into this work. Um, mm -hmm. To me, it also looks like nonprofits that are abundantly resourced um, and better able to navigate barriers that, they, that may impede them meeting their mission. Um, I like to see nonprofits in a position where they're able to multiply the impact of their efforts through a really strong cross-sector network. 
and that that network is moving in unison to shift the social conditions in our community. Um, I think ultimately I'd like to see the silos that exist broken and folks working together um, to define, um, refine and implement the changes that we want to see. Um, I think if I if I had to sum it all, all of that up, yeah, I'd like to see what's now considered the normal context in which we work, the inequity, mm -hmm. uh, these power dynamics, everything that we've been talking about. I'd like to see that exist as abnormal and and be considered unacceptable. Oh, um, Alondra for president. <laughs> <laughs> If you ran on that platform, I am sure you would have a lot of support. But no, we, we, we need you where you are with your expertise. Um, that is beautiful and um, incredibly powerful. And I really hope that is the future that we are moving towards, Alondra. Thank you for painting that picture. Um, oh, fortunately, you. we are... Sorry. <laughs> Um, we are out of time uh, and I just want to encourage viewers, please learn more about Coact Detroit. They are a phenomenal organization. Uh, you can find them on the internet at coact, C-O-A-C-T, Detroit.org. And I know for sure, if you want to learn about some of the ways that Alandra and her team have, uh, you know, been able to bring funders together to be able to, um, you know, challenge the, the inequitable dynamics in our sector, then, you know, one way would be to make a nice donation to Coact Detroit. And then I'm sure they'll be happy to, you know, share all the expertise with you as well. <laughs> Um, and please do check out the Capital Collaborative Program by Camelback Ventures. Uh, it's a program that helps white funders deepen their commitment and efforts to advance racial equity and racial justice through their work in philanthropy and impact investing. You can find more information at camelbackventures.org. That is all for today. Thank you so much, Alondra. And thank you, everybody, for tuning in and listening.